I really believe that this pandemic has allowed the industry to highlight and strengthen its role as a catalyst for social development in the areas where we operate. And, and, and I think Mark really alluded to this uh, at the beginning. We, we, we work in very remote and rural communities, in rural communities where the government is basically not present. And I think the role of the mining industry in assisting these communities and protecting their people from the COVID has been fundamental. It has really reinforced the role that we play as an industry, having a, a very strong capacity to positively impact and create shared value in the areas where we operate. I think that as well as an industry, it has demonstrated the importance and effectiveness of articulating initiatives through our industry associations much more than ever before. And in order to deliver real support and impact, right? Like donating through the mining chamber, medical tests, equipment, oxygen plants, etc. you know, like never before. And this has certainly created a very significant impact. Uh, I think the third, the, this situation has pushed us to the limit in breaking many operational paradigms, forcing us to become much more flexible and efficient, truly thinking out of the box and relearning to keep our business running, you know. The migration to working remotely or from home, not only on administrative or support time, but also in technical activities has been really remarkable. The capacity to adapt our organization, changing the operating model and migrating into an agile type of structure, redeploying resources according to the new requirements and priorities of the, of the business in the pandemic has also been remarkable, you know. And as a result, I believe the mining industry has been the first to resume its activities in Peru and Brazil and is currently operating at almost the pre-COVID levels. This has required a, a significant change in culture where we're going basically against uh, the, the human nature, especially in Latin America, where, where we want to be close of each other, very close to each other. Changing that by implementing social distancing and the enforcement of protocols has been a very significant challenge in terms of a cultural change. Changing a culture requires sometimes years. In this case, it was only a few weeks. Last, uh, and maybe not least, I think that through this pandemic, we have really confirmed the importance of the government's role and specifically of having consistent, effective, and clear regulations as a key enabler of our ability as an industry to help navigate this crisis in the countries where we operate. In other words, our ability to positively influence the results and how to deal with the pandemic is directly related to the government regulation. Overregulation can be a deterrent and can strongly impact the capacity that we have to help and support the local communities and the country as a whole. Clear government direction is essential to be able to articulate a timely industry-wide response to emergencies uh, as the one that we have been able to put together. So government regulation has also been very important. For us in Australia, it's been really a story of cooperation and collaboration. Uh, our first case in Australia was identified, uh, I think, on the 25th of January, and it spread very quickly across, uh, across the nation. And it led to governments uh, shutting down what were considered non-essential industries, a, a lot of our, our retail, our accommodation, tourism, uh, fitness industries closed very quickly. So we needed to, um, to act very, very quickly. Uh, and, you know, with the recognition that the mining industry is, you know, it, it had a really critical role to play, uh, both in um, keeping our workforce safe, our, you know, the families and communities very safe, but also contributing economically and socially in rem remote and regional uh, communities. So uh, it, we needed to make sure that government recognised that the mining industry was really essential to, um, to the economy uh, continuing through the pandemic, knowing that we didn't know really how long it was going to last. We only had um, knowledge of what was going on at an international uh, level. So um, uh, with that in mind, um, the MCA working 
very closely with uh, the coordinating uh, with the state mining chambers, uh, noting we're a federated um, economy. So we have states and territories and at a national level, we have our, our overarching government. We moved pretty quickly to develop our resources industry protocols. We did that in partnership with the oil and gas industry and our state um, chambers. Uh, so it wasn't the only thing that we needed to do. Well, we were confident that we had the right processes um, because health and safety is foremost to our industry, as already has been noted. Uh, we needed to convince government that our protocols would be able to see our industries through uh, this pandemic stage. So we worked, we had to work with what was occurring in each of the states. Uh, there was a chief medical officer at a national level and at a state level providing advice to those governments and to a national government. Um, and then there was a national coordination commission set up, a national coordination mechanism, and we had our own resources ministers. So we were tapping into governments at all levels, working with the partners that I've identified. Um, and we needed to make sure that industry continued to lead. So ours was a mining industry uh, led recovery. Our board was engaged the whole way along. We had board members participating, driving working groups. We had a people movement group to make sure we could have FIFO workers working across, uh, across boundaries. We had supply arrangement issues, again, to move uh, supply, critical supplies across borders. And very importantly, communities and, uh, and an Indigenous task force to, uh, to provide the support that was needed uh, to those communities. So this really worked well for us. Um, and I think the industry moved very fast to meet all of the state regulatory constraints that were, were there and also moved uh, moving the workforces across states and locating those workforces within states so that we didn't get caught out by, um, by what were quite strict quarantine uh, conditions. So there were changes to roster patterns. Uh, there were site-specific management plans that were needed. There were tailored arrangements for workers in remote communities in how they dealt with Indigenous communities and new, um, as Mark mentioned, new processes to deliver essential services, water, power. Um, so mobilising everyone to cooperate and to collaborate really has been the key to our success and would be one of the first things that uh, would need to be done if we were to see something like this in the future. I'd like to come back to the, the community question. Mark Anglo is known for her investing and has invested a lot of time and effort over the years in um, social performance management and community engagement. It would be interesting just to hear in a few words from you how um, that has um, uh, served you and, and, and what you learned in terms of the um, engagement with communities. In terms of Anglo-American, uh, for those that know our history, we had a lot of a lot to do with um, some of the uh, development of, of improvements around HIV many years back in South Africa in particular, and we were the first company, I understand, that provided antivirals to employees and families. Um, and that health infrastructure that we had, certainly given the success we've had in, in containing that pandemic, uh, served us well and has helped guide our early work on the health side. So we were very active in the community and we learned very early that if you can work with your employees in their processes and their understandings, and it goes both ways, you can take that into the local communities and actually help develop the understanding at a very practical level in those communities, which then helps keep the community safe. And the principle that we developed around that was we need to keep our communities safe for the businesses to operate. It has to go both ways because we're all coming from the same place. Everyone goes home every night in some cases. In some cases, we've got different accommodation. So getting that principle across in our business was really important. And 
What we then did is we've suggested to both the regional governments and federal governments, if you've got major businesses associated, it doesn't have to be mining, associated with major communities, our ability as a major business to procure protective equipment and a whole range of other things that average community members can't get hold of is absolutely key to helping the community say, uh, improve its safety. The other side of that was, and, and I use a survey, we did surveys in the communities and, and trying to understand what people were most worried about and trying to understand what they saw as the way of protecting themselves. And 35% of respondents in South Africa said it was gone that would help them get through. The cue for us was to contact our local churches and say, how can we engage with you and um, your constituents and help provide what we can provide to keep them safe? So that's where the food parcels and a whole range of other things that we hadn't have thought of ourselves started to come into play. So engaging with all of the key community constituents and it, and it ranges, but the, the role of business in helping communities keep themselves safe is this, because we can bring all this stuff in and we've got the supply chains, we can actually accelerate and help communities improve their defences and at the same time provide them sanitizer and a whole range of processes, PPE. And I think that engagement and, and both uh, Jan Louise and uh, Tanya made the point about cooperation. And it goes much further than we would normally see in normal circumstances. And when that starts to work, and I'd say it took around two or three weeks for people to start trusting each other in a very different type of discourse and conversation. But now people say to us, we feel safer coming to work than we do in our home situation because we've still got to go out and buy food. We've still got to expose ourselves to people we don't know. And that's natural. We're all in the same place. But if they've got um, a structure to work with, they've got guidance they can use, they can help their fellow community members, then from our point of view, it starts to create a, a critical mass of people behaving consistently and trying to help keep each other safe. And I think businesses beyond mining can play that role. And I think uh, that's been the real big learning and certainly something where we've been able to help and getting the right gear to the right people in those communities has been key. Thanks, Bob. Um, Juan Luis, have you seen the same kind of delivery? And while you answer, maybe you can answer one of the questions that has come in on the, the chat, which, which, which says that mining companies are using the pandemic as an opportunity to whitewash their records and present themselves as public-minded saviors. So it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on that. I think the, the pandemic uh, evidenced uh, the, the interdependence and the integration of our activities with the local communities since the outset. Uh, and we realized uh, this uh, very quickly as an opportunity to kind of change the narrative and the dynamic between the, com the mining companies and, 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 and the communities through a very direct engagement since the very beginning uh, and, and changing in a way the way we interact and relate with the local communities. Mainly because unfortunately in the past, the, the relationship had been more focused on the personal leadership of the local authorities and leaders of the communities, sometimes even looking after their own interests instead of looking after the common well-being of the of the communities by having like this common enemy which is the, the COVID, uh we all focused on one single purpose which is how do we together fight this battle you know on a stronger way and in a better way so this opened up an opportunity for a more constructive uh and i would say more pers purpose purposeful dialogue right uh and also an opportunity to start articulating much better the actions amongst all levels of government, no? Um, this has allowed us to leapfrog projects that have been stalled for years. For instance, we had been in a small town close to one of our mining operations in Puno, in Peru, in Antauta. We had been trying to set up a new healthcare facility for three or four years without success, mainly because the government will stop it. In one month, it was done. 
one month, the best healthcare facility in the whole area. Okay, and that's just an example of how this has changed the narrative and the dynamic. And it's a great opportunity. It has really allowed us to create very strong goodwill and alignment of interests. Finally, we believe we're all aligned. And of course, this has allowed us to extend our, our protocols, right, to the communities. We have a full integration where we now have, I mean, we, we realized very early on that healthy operations require healthy communities, right? And so we have all the protocols in place exactly as the ones that we have in our operations in all the communities. And again, going back to the cultural change, we have been able to create awareness and educate people on the importance of enforcing these protocols to protect themselves and protect the community. You know? We have been able to, through this change of dynamic and narrative, improve significantly the health infrastructure provide, to provide medical supplies, medical equipment, health professionals. Everywhere we, where the mining industry operates, uh, we have uh, a much better performance and a much higher standard in terms of how to deal with the COVID. So I think it is and it has become an opportunity as the question rightfully uh, implied. Tanya, um, any, any, any response to the, the, the whitewashing comment in terms of support to the communities? And, and perhaps you might also like to talk specifically to um, how the industry has engaged with indigenous communities in, in that context at a national level, we had our national Aboriginal uh, community um, controlled health organisation, NACHO, working with health organisation in a, um, a chairing partnership to lead that Indigenous response. So when, uh, when the government put into place Commonwealth Biosecurity um, uh, uh, Act, to um, remove access to remote communities. The mining industry's job was to make sure that we listened to what their needs were, um, supported in um, providing uh, food security, uh, communication, all of the, the, the water supplies, the food supplies, um, getting people uh, you know, communicating in and out of communities. Well, we couldn't have that face-to-face -face discussion. We were listening to make sure that we were meeting their needs along the way. So we maintained that over a long period of time. Uh, we set up uh, within the mining industry our own mining um, Indigenous task force within uh, the groups that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there were weekly meetings to think about and talk about uh, what the needs, um, how we would react to the needs that we were hearing about. Uh, we made sure that we developed a package of tools and resources to support the industry's response to the communities. And importantly, every single mining company stepped up and did what their own communities needed at a local level whether it was supporting them through providing food, uh, providing supplies, um, making sure that uh, that companies, um, uh, uh, you know, enabled that communication uh, to occur at a, at a uh, remote community level. So the responses were very different based on those local local needs. So again, it was a strong partnership led by Indigenous people. Uh, engagement um, with them transparently and regularly, although it wasn't face to face, there was that deep connection uh, that was, um, you know, was there to support the communities rather than um, act as the saviours for those communities. I'd like to turn now to um, uh, the future and, and maybe uh, in, in looking at the future, we can answer one of the questions that has popped up a few times on the screen um, from attendees, which is, uh, how has COVID accelerated change? And what is the future workforce going to look like? So, Mark, any thoughts on that? And more generally, what the future holds for us given this pandemic? I think in many ways, COVID will support an acceleration of change and maybe if I make one point reflecting on the previous question, uh, for the last five years as Anglo, we report every six months our safety statistics, our health statistics, 
our environmental statistics and we're building our social plan so that we'll start reporting those as well. And you'll see that across all of those statistics, we've improved somewhere between 70 and 80%. So we're the first to acknowledge that we're still a works in progress. We're not down to zero on those measures, but gee, we're getting close and we've still got a way to go and we still have incidents we don't want to have, but we're getting better. In terms of um, what we do, we ask that we be judged on our actions and therefore you should look at all of our performance improvements. And our response to COVID is simply about trying to do things better. And that doesn't mean we've done it as well as we could have. Um, and at some point, we hope that people will recognise that the effort and the work that's going in across the board is helping improve the performance of our industry and certainly the way we present ourselves to our community. So our view is that COVID and uh, the issues around COVID certainly heightens the sensitivity to community, to ESG issues, and the pace of change that I just talked to needs to continue to accelerate. And again, I'm actually quite comfortable people saying, you guys haven't got it right because you've made this mistake. And what I would say is, well, we're at, we've come a long way, we're not there yet, and we're gonna keep driving forward. And we hope that people can be balanced in the way they look at it and say, okay, they're improving, but they need to improve quicker. I think that will come out of COVID. I think whether you're talking climate change, whether you're talking circular economy, more and more people are now starting to understand that if we eliminate the use of thermal coal, and that's a good thing in terms of carbon make and those sorts of issues, and that's a longer term objective, and we certainly committed to that with our carbon neutral targets, but you're going to need more copper, more nickel, and a whole range of other mined products to utilise the sun or hydropower or renewable power, we need different types of minerals. And the mining industry has a critical role to play in how communities and how society transforms for the future. And so when people say the mining industry, the mining industry literally produces all of the goods and products that we actually need to survive. How do we do it better? That's the real question. I think it'll speed up the social sensitivity to what we do and how we do things. And I think that's absolutely critical. And for a company, and as Jan Louise was scratching out earlier, for a company that rebuilt its whole purpose in 2017, and every time we make a decision, we check and test whether we're living those values of reimagining mining to improve people's lives, whether we can say that on a broad basis is something that we want to be held to account to, but we do hope that people recognise it's a journey, we're getting better, but we've still got a long way to go and we want to get there quicker. Juan well, Luis, are you aligned with that? Anything that you would add to that in the context of uh, Peru and Brazil? Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm completely aligned with what Mark said. Uh, we, we certainly be, we see this as a, as a great opportunity for the mining industry coming out of the pandemic, uh, Tom. And I, I, I can think of this as an opportunity in four dimensions, right? The first one is that I think we're changing the way we work. And through the pandemic, we will have a much more resilient and efficient industry. Accelerating digital transformation will be, we will require a change in the skills of our people. And we believe that this agile or lean uh, organization is here to stay in, 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 in the industry. The second dimension, and I think we have talked a lot about it today, is that this is an opportunity to really change the way we interact with the communities, set a new tone, a new dynamic with the communities, and a great opportunity to really gain a lot of credibility through the demonstration of the power of working together, right? Creating well-being and, and, and social value together. The third dimension, I think, is the relationship that we have with the government at all levels. I think the pandemic has really evidenced that uh, the capacity that we have as an industry to basically catalyze, to become a catalyst for, for development, 
is 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 very very big, especially in in underdeveloped countries, right? So so this is a real opportunity to enhance the articulation between the private and the public sector to create a, a much stronger response to to crises like like the one we're facing. I think it has also highlighted very significantly the role that mining has as a key industry to reactivate the economy post-COVID. You know, the, the economic crisis coming out of the pandemic is going to be, is probably the strongest we've had in more than a century uh, worldwide. And, and mining, especially in countries like Peru and, and Brazil, is a key industry to, to, to contribute to this reactivation. So there's a huge opportunity there to working together with the government to promote the development of mining projects that are in the pipeline. I really have to emphasize the importance of mining and promoting the development of new projects in order to be able to contribute to the post-COVID world, right? We have projects like Tia Maria in Peru. Uh, of course, we have Queyabeco, we have Mina Justa. We have many projects that are in construction right now that have to be completed, but we have many projects that are ready to go, like Tia Maria, for instance. I think the time has come. I think the time has come, and this is the, the, the right moment and the opportunity. And last but not least, uh, and there was a question around this, I think this is a great opportunity to really change the perception and the image of our industry. We have been able to really create significant and real impact uh, supporting the pandemic in, in throughout the areas where we operate. We have evidence that our health and safety performance is better than other industries, and this is now recognized by the population. And we have been able to create a positive perception around uh, the, the contributions that we have made to the pandemic, becoming this a building block to reconstruct the image of the industry going forward, in my view. We have earned that right, and we have basically demonstrated the capacity again to create shared value. I think that going forward, this is a great opportunity. Uh, we really recognized for what we are, you know, a key driver of sustainable development uh, in the countries where we conduct our activities. Tanya, anything to add to that? And, and in particular, um, since you're at the head of a national association, um, are you starting to think about how to be even better prepared for the next time around? Um, well, I think uh, in short, yes, is the answer to that, uh, Tom. But I think it's important to note that we're really still in the midst of, uh, of the pandemic and we've got a second wave sweeping through Australia and, and of course, uh, Melbourne. We've got a city locked down at the moment and we're starting to see cases pop up. Uh, now in New South Wales, which, you know, we're quite concerned about what might happen over the next few weeks. But, uh, you know, I, I think that we are starting to see more and more pandemics uh, and uh, we, you know, we may see even a new um, a new strain creeping in over the next couple of years if, uh, if you listen to what's happening um, at a global level uh, with the World Health Organisation. But uh, I think that this this pandemic has really highlighted that the mining industry is not just good at um, at providing economically in countries like Australia. Uh, you know, fifty eight percent of exports, two hundred and forty thousand direct jobs, one point one million uh, across the value chain. So that's one in ten Australians in this industry. But we are incredibly good, and it's recognised at a um, at a community level and at a government level, that we have led the way. The mining industry is held up as the industry that is um, is cutting edge. It has led in the way that we have addressed this pandemic, and we've led because we are good at health and safety. Uh, we're good at communities and working with regional communities, and really, that's that's um, that has meant that we've been able to get ahead of the game quickly. But importantly, um, it's that moving fast and being flexible has made all of the difference. And we will need to um, to retain, maintain that sort of agility for the future. Um, and we're already uh, talking to government and providing them with. The lessons that we're seeing so far in how we have developed those networks and relationships, um, quickly tapping into that government thinking, and that's being used for other industries. So, 
the lessons for us are, are and the lessons at an economy, um, a whole of economy level, have been to make sure that we've taken, um, you know, that uh, that approach of uh, health and safety and um, and applied that across the economy as a whole. So I think that uh, that's really, um, you know, our starting point for the future um, and how we might address uh, another pandemic uh, if it was to, to, to happen again. If you had to pick what what is the best thing that would have come out of this crisis, what would you highlight? I would think um, that the relationship and relationships that we've built across a much broader spectrum of community as we've worked to find solutions to these issues um, has been the most positive. I think it's a learning both ways. Um, one thing that people don't appreciate, and, and I'm on the board of Power of Nutrition, is in all likelihood the greater tragedy of this pandemic will obviously be, one, the lives lost, those directly impacted, but a far greater impact and a greater loss of lives is likely to come as a consequence of the nutrition and what's impacted in countries like or continents, Africa, India itself in terms of the unintended consequences in other parts of the world, where the loss due to nutrition issues, the fact that aid to many of the countries around the world have been cut because of people's need to react to this is actually far greater in loss. So we need to understand both. So I think the important thing is, one, we're working better together and, and probably off a lower base than any of us would like to to admit, but I think it's certainly been a significant improvement. And secondly, how other things are connected. And from here, I think we've got to do a lot more uh, foundation work to improve nutrition type issues as well. And that's something we're already thinking about as a group. The best is going to be coming out of this pandemic is, is, is in a way a, a relaunch of the importance that the mining industry has on a much broader role than just uh, you know, uh, producing sustainable minerals for the world. Tanya, the last word goes to you. Well, the power of a whole industry uh, working cooperatively together meant that we had uh, a few cases of COVID, uh, but not very many. Uh, we lost no lives and uh, we made sure that our communities uh, were well supported. So in terms of uh, how you might act as, as an industry when times get tough and you're in crisis, I think that's uh, the power of a whole industry working together quickly was demonstrated um, at, its, you know, at its very best uh, in Australia.